Hello, everyone. My name is Kinaret, and I'm the lead research community officer on the WMF research team. Welcome to this month's research showcase. Uh, showcases, as you probably know already, are monthly convenings organized by our team to recognize and share recent research on or about Wikimedia projects. Uh, for those of you who are joining us live, we welcome you to ask questions of the speakers in the chat. Uh, we, will we will monitor this channel and pass the questions to them at the end of each presentation. We kindly ask that all attendees follow the friendly space policy and the universal code of conduct. And as always, before we get started, I do have a few announcements. So the first one is that the research team is currently drafting and revising a research ethics white paper focused on the topic of privacy. Among other things, the draft proposes best practices for researchers and privacy. The in-progress draft is currently available on MetaWiki and open for comments and feedback through April 30th. We invite everyone to review and leave comments and questions on the Meta uh, talk page, which Eli will shortly share in the chat. We'll also be hosting a conversation hour on April 23rd, 2024 uh, at 3 p.m. UTC. If you'd like to participate, please find the Google Media information in the draft page of the Meta page we just discussed. And submissions for Wiki Workshop, our annual convenings are still open. Submissions for the research track are open until this coming Monday, April 22nd. And submissions for Wiki Workshop Hall, our newest track are open until April 29th, 2024. More information about both of these and about Wiki Workshop in general is available at wikiworkshop.org. Uh, so we invite you to submit uh, your proposals. Next up is that nominations for the Wikimedia Foundation Research Award of the Year close tomorrow. The award is meant to recognize recent research that has the potential to have significant impact on the Wikimedia projects or research in this space. Uh, we invite you to uh, nominate anyone for this award. Winners will be announced during Wiki Workshop. Finally, as a last reminder, I want to remind everyone that the research team offers individual office hours for personal consultations about anything Wiki research related. Uh, or anything related to the initiatives that I just announced. Uh, so feel free to schedule some time with us and learn more on the Media Wiki page that we'll share in the chat. And we look forward to seeing you during these, uh, these office hours. That's it for announcements. I'll now pass it over to my colleague, Isaac, who will introduce the theme and speakers of this month. Thank you, Kinaret. Um, thanks. And hello all, I'm Isaac Johnson. I'm a senior research scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation. Glad to introduce the April 2024 Research Showcase. So today's topic will be supporting multimedia on Wikipedia. Um, we often focus on language and text when it comes to Wikipedia, but multimedia and in particular images are a core component to how readers experience Wikipedia. And yet we see that about 40% of articles on Wikipedia are lacking imagery and the statistics get worse when you consider captions and alt text as our first speaker will share. Uh, this gap takes on greater urgency as well in our evolving digital world, which continues to shift consumption towards rich excuse me, towards rich visual content. And within research, we're seeing the rise of multimodal models in the AI space and increasing interest in high quality visual data sets. So our two speakers today are presenting projects that are excellent examples of rising to these challenges and developing really interesting interventions around imagery and Wikipedia. Our first speaker, Elisa, is an assistant professor of communication at UCLA and the lab director of the Qualys uh, Computation and Language for Society Lab. Previously, she completed a PhD in linguistics at Stanford, where she was a member of Stanford's NLP group and the Stanford Data Science Center for Open and Reproducible Science, or CORES. In her work, Elisa investigates how we produce and understand language in the visual world, combining tools from natural language processing, psycholinguistics, and hum human-computer interaction. Her research has direct applications to image accessibility, the challenge of sometimes automatically generating image descriptions for blind and low vision users. Um, and she'll be talking about this very topic in relation to Wikipedia today. After Lisa, our second speaker is Danu, Daniel Nakemelu, who is a PhD candidate in human-centered computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology. In his research, Daniel applies machine learning and building novel tools to support civil society organizations tackling disinformation and hate speech in low resource contexts like Myanmar and Nigeria. His work advances our understanding of these online threats in the global south and how to ethically and safely apply technology in response to them. Daniel is a governance and technology fellow at the Carter Center and was a finalist for the Meta PhD Fellowship in 2022. 
He previously completed a master's in electrical and computer engineering at Carnegie Mellon University and a bachelor's in computer scientists, computer science at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. He'll be presenting his research on converting Wikipedia articles into rich image text stories. After each talk, we'll have about 10 minutes for discussion. Happy to take your questions in the YouTube chat, where my colleague Eli will monitor the chat and relay the questions back to us. And with that, let's pass it on to Elisa. Elisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isaac, for this wonderful and very generous introduction. Um, All right, so thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm uh, not sharing the right slides. One second. Now I'm sharing the right slides. All right. Today, I will talk about the challenges that come with using visual content in online media. And it's everywhere, partially because the inclusion of such visual content has had clear and measurable benefits in various outcomes, including improving education outcomes and strengthening social connectivity. On Wikipedia, for example, as Isaac was saying, images are the media source that users mo most interact with. So there's this increased use of visual communicative tools that benefits many, but at the same time, this, this excludes people who can't visually access this content. When our eyesight falls into the low vision or blind spectrum, it means that these visual aids can pose a unique challenge for capturing the full context of everyday communication. And this has been shown to affect blind and low vision users' ability to learn, to stay informed, to engage socially, or to create content. But why does visual content pose a special challenge for accessibility in a way that text doesn't? To illustrate this, we can imagine that we just got a notification that I tweeted something. And in order to read my tweet, we can rely on special tools like a screen reader. So let's say I had tweeted, I'm so excited for the talk today. Then a screen reader would just read that out. But now let's say I had actually posted an image of my dog, Peggy. To the screen reader, this is just a bunch of pixels. So what it needs is a description of this image. And this is what's called an alt or accessibility description. And an appropriate one in this case might be cute small dog sitting on a sidewalk, looking up with big eyes, ears are propped up. However, these accessibility descriptions are extremely rare. On Twitter, for instance, only 0.1% of images have the so-called alt text. And as of 2023, I reconfirmed that this number is actually still accurate. So today I will present how framing accessibility as a communication problem highlights important ways forward in redefining image accessibility on Wikipedia and why current AI tools have a potential to help, but still fall short. Specifically, I will present my recent work that show, shows how useful image description writing and generation needs to be shaped by two fundamental communicative goals. The communicative goal of the text itself and the communicative goal of the image. So let me get, begin uh, with this first point and by explaining what I mean by an image-based text's communicative goal. Let me take this image showing an educational sketch of a plant explaining the various parts that make up this plant. And let's say we have encountered this image in the Wikipedia article on multimodal pedagogy, um, which is an approach to teaching that implements different modes of communication, including visual and linguistic. Now let's create an accessibility description for this image. Maybe something like an educational sketch of a plant illustrating the shoot system, which is above the soil and the root system, which is below the soil. The different parts of the plant are labeled to point out, for example, the plant's reproductive shoot, there's the flower or the lateral roots. So this is one image-based text, but there's actually a second image-based text on this slide. And basically all images on Wikipedia have it or a large majority of them, which is 
um, called uh, example of complementing linguistic and visual information leading to learning benefits over unimodal approaches. And this is the text below the image. In journalism jargon and library sciences, this is commonly called a caption. And the other image-based text uh, is in these fields commonly called a description or a visual description of the image. Now, both of these texts are image-based texts, but they have very distinct communicative goals. Descriptions need to replace an image and therefore list all relevant aspects of an image. Captions presuppose that the person already has access to the image content, and the caption simply complements that information with details like how the image relates to the broader context or the source of the image or who painted it, etc. And importantly, one cannot play the role of the other, and only descriptions are suitable for serving an accessibility goal. On Wikipedia, captions and descriptions tend to be treated as two distinct entities, but to what extent the content actually reflects that is different in various communities. And we will get back to this point in a few minutes. In AI, we are largely treating descriptions and captions exactly the same, often without considering how these tasks are fundamentally different. In fact, it all fa falls under the same umbrella term of image captioning, the task of generating some linguistic text that is based on an image. And this is a fundamental constraint with the problem definition in developing vision language AI systems today. So the hypothesis is that there are fundamentally different image-based texts and that this distinction is actually reflected and measurable in current data sets and models. And if we don't pay attention to this distinction, people's accessibility efforts and the resulting models will be misaligned with accessibility needs. So let's investigate this. So to investigate the reality behind the visual description and caption distinction, we've introduced a Wikipedia-based data set called Concadia, which contains images and their corresponding captions, as well as accessibility descriptions that were written by Wikipedia editors. And a for first important thing to note when discussing the description caption distinction on Wikipedia is their distinction in distribution. Based on 10,000 randomly sampled English language articles, we estimate that about 90% of images embedded in the main uh, texts have associated captions, but only 6% have an associated alt description. And those 6% still include low quality descriptions that simply consist of the image's file name or are non-English language. So the true coverage of useful alt text on English language Wikipedia is therefore much lower than 6%. And this further dramatically highlights the accessibility challenge. But aside from the clear difference in distribution, how do captions and descriptions differ semantically? Here's one example from the Wikipedia article on bananas. The caption that appears below the image reads, Cavendish bananas are the main commercial banana cultivars sold in the world market. The accessibility description for the image reads, grocery store photo of several bunches of banana of bananas. So clearly, the caption would be inappropriate as an accessibility description, and reversely, descriptions would make an incredibly unhelpful caption. So this reflects some of the expected patterns, but does this actually scale up over the whole data set? One way of investigating the distinction between descriptions and captions is by looking at their most frequent biograms, two words. For captions here on the left, we see a variety of names as well as events like San Francisco, Prime Minister, Film Festival, Tour de France, or World War. In the descriptions, we instead see phrases about image aesthetics like white photograph, white photo, color photograph, or appearance-based descriptors like white shirt, military uniform, or dark hair. Another way we can look at this data is by inspecting which words are unexpectedly frequent in each category. And here a similar pattern emerges. Captions tend to be use more event-related language, like achieved, or award, or winner, or critics. But descriptions contain more descriptive language, like microphone, background, mustache, brunette, etc. And this is similarly reflected in the parts of speech analysis. While captions contain more proper nouns, descriptions contain more descriptive nouns and adjectives. And this makes sense. Proper nouns like 
people's names will add information about the image you might not have known otherwise. But nouns and adjectives tend to pick out information that are clearly observable. So the data suggests that accessibility descriptions and captions seem to align with different communicative goals. But is this distinction actually connected to the text communicative goal? And secondly, should we expect this to affect the type of texts that AI models might generate? To investigate these questions, we conducted a pre-registered human subject experiment. And in this experiment, we took images from our data set and displayed them next to a sample text. So the sample text could be a description or caption associated with the image. And this could be either from the data set, so from Wikipedia, or from models trained on description or caption data separately. And if this part interests you, please reach out to me after or consult our publication that I cited on the slide, because I don't have time to get into this. So the text that could appear with the image could be a description or caption that people actually wrote, or the ones generated by a model. And then we asked two questions. The first one is getting at the text's descriptive quality. How useful would the text alone be to help someone imagine this picture? And the second one is getting at the quality to contextualize and provide non-redundant information, such as how much did you learn from the, uh, from the text that you couldn't learn from the image? And the results are very encouraging for our hypothesis. We find that human written descriptions from Concadia, which are presented in green, are considered more useful for imagining the picture than captions are presented in orange. On the other hand, people learn more from captions than they do from accessibility descriptions. So now the captions, again, here in orange, get the highest rating. So this is strong support that captions and accessibility descriptions actively optimize for different communicative goals. And this is actually important for models as well. When we show participants the texts generated by the models, the results pattern exactly like the human written texts do, suggesting that models are picking up on the nature of this distinction and it affects their downstream performance. So the results from all analyses, the large data analysis, the model learning analysis that we're presenting in the paper and the controlled human subject experiment they all suggest that the communicative goal of our utterance changes the information that become useful. And I want to briefly illustrate the relevance of this for Wikipedia based on one example. Very commonly on Wikipedia, alt texts are actually identical to the image captions. However, the degree differs for different languages. So in this plot, Wikipedia languages are on the x-axis. Don't worry if you cannot read it. And the percentage of alt descriptions that are identical to captions are on the y-axis. And in English, more than 60% of all alt texts are identical with the captions. This is more than in German, where it's about 35%, and lower than in Urdu, where it's about 90%. Following what I just argued, all these rates are too high though since alt texts and captions should complement each other. And this is in some sense understood by the official Wikipedia alt text guide. The guide shows a picture of three toothbrushes with the caption comparison of three different types of toothbrush. The guide explains that a good alt text here wouldn't be repeating the caption, but instead saying refer to caption in the alt text to avoid this repetitiveness. And this makes sense under the view that they're complementing, but I think that we need to go one step further here. What is the goal of the image? The goal of the image is to allow a user to see the features of the three distinct types of toothbrush. So an effective alt text doesn't need to contain the topic, but actually talk about the relevant features to make the image accessible. A potentially helpful heuristic to think about might be, what does the image add to any seeing user, given the caption? And the answer to this might be the alt text that you're looking for. So now we have explored how a distinction in the text's communicative goal should change utterance content and the suitability for functioning a priori as accessibility descriptions. But attention to the text's goal alone will not suffice. 
And this is where we come to the second challenge I will focus on today, the images communicative goal matters too. And for that, let's return to our motivating example from earlier. With this image and the visual description and educational sketch of a plant illustrating the shoot system, which is above the soil, and the root system, which is below the soil, the different parts of the plant are labeled to point out, for example, the plant's reproductive shoot or the lateral roots. And this is embedded into the Wikipedia article on multimodal pedagogy. So here, the purpose of the image is to exemplify complementing visual and linguistic information in one figure to aid learning. And the visual description, I think, nicely communicates that, not just because I wrote it, I think, objectively. This is a good description for this particular uh, context. However, the same image could similarly appear in a Wikipedia article on plant anatomy. Here, the purpose of the image is to enable the reader to learn and understand what the different parts of the, of the plant are called and how I can identify them. So now the previous description seems highly insufficient. Imagine that I'm a student using this Wikipedia page to practice for an exam. Then this description won't allow me to learn what I need to learn. Instead, I need an image description more like this. A sketch of a plant illustrating the shoot system, which is above the soil, and the root system, which is below the soil. Part of the root system are the tap roots and the lateral roots. The tap root refers to the central root, and the lateral roots are the smaller side roots that, etc., etc., etc. So mentioning the labels now becomes absolutely essential if this text is intended to replace the image and still enable the same communicative function. So in this previous article on multimodal pedagogy, listing all the labels and how they relate to the plant would be distracting. It would be absolutely overbearing and it would just not be useful. So the informational selection is fundamentally guided by the communicative goals of the image in that particular context. Now, how important is knowing the context where an image appears for actually writing accessibility descriptions that are good and useful? In a recent study we did, we investigated this in the context of newly emergent, emerging description evaluation tools in AI. So in this study, we specifically manipulated the context in which images appeared. For instance, we placed the same image of a church in the Wikipedia articles on building material, Christian cross and roof. Then we asked sighted and blind and low vision participants to rate descriptions that were written for those images within those contexts. We then correlated those human participant ratings, which are presented here on the x-axis, against the ratings assigned by the current state-of-the-art AI evaluation tool that doesn't take context into account. So for each description, we have ratings from people for how good it is and a rating from the evaluation tool. And if this tool is a useful evaluation metric, we should see a good correlation in this graph, which might look so, uh, something like this. So as the tool's ratings increase, the human ratings should increase. If there is no correlation, we expect to see a fitted line that looks something like this, where literally one cannot predict the other. And everything in between would suggest a decent but not ultimately reliable metric. And here's what we find. We actually found that the evaluation tool, which cannot integrate context, has no correlation at all with human ratings. And that's true for both sighted as well as blind and low vision participants. So as soon as we enable people to judge a description within a context an image appeared in, the correlation with this evaluation tool just vanishes. So taken together, these results show that one size fits all descriptions aren't suitable for serving accessibility needs. For AI research, this means that context cannot be ignored until the later stage of AI research when we're ready for it, because otherwise we're steering our models during development in unhelpful directions. For human annotations, this means that we need to find integrative solutions to writing descriptions that strongly reflect the context those images are in. So what I want you to take away from this is that communicative goals determine what makes descriptions useful for accessibility. And it requires fundamental research and community efforts to understand how to promote and evaluate 
useful accessibility description writing and generation. I'm now happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Elisa. Um, fascinating presentation. I know for at least for myself, and I think folks uh, are coming out of the like Wikimedia context too, I very much appreciate your focus on defining a lot of these terms because within Wikimedia, like for instance, captions and descriptions within Wikimedia actually are very similar um, within Commons, but then you have the yeah, alt text within the actual article. And then there's also some alt text on Wikidata. And so it kind of scatters around. And so just even just bringing in that kind of clearer terminology and goals around that, I already am finding this very useful for how I think think about this. Um, I'm going to open it up to folks in the room. If anyone has any questions and like would like to come off uh, mute and ask them to Lisa, I will, I will make space. Also, let me know. I realize this is my final slide, and I have gifts here, which seem actually quite distracting now that the <laughs> this is just standing. Let me know if I should switch to a less distracting slide. <laughs> Go for it, Miriam. Sorry, it took me a while to find a raise hand in Zoom. Um, Eliza, thank you so much. Um, this is this is extremely important work and there are so many things we don't know and that thanks to your work like we we learn to to actually think about and this this is this is really really valuable work for us i have a question that is in um some related work that you, that you might have heard of we've been trying to evaluate uh, the quality of our text uh in terms of um you know whether there's a um, there is the automatic or manual production of um, of alt text is in a way um, high quality enough to be put on Wikipedia. Um, we have encountered so many different guidelines and so many ways to define uh, alt text quality, and you seem to have a good method to evaluate the usefulness of, of alt text. And so I know you were short in time, but if you can elaborate a little bit on this, um, it, it would be very uh, useful for us to know like how we can objectively ask people to evaluate the usefulness. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And um, I'm not going to claim I have the answer to it because I do believe, oh, um, I wanted to share a different slide, but it's OK. Go for um, it. um, my screen sharing was just terminated. I don't know what happened. Um, so, um, so I'm not going to claim I have all the answers to what you just asked, Miriam, but I can share what we are doing and how we have, we've established this. Um, so, okay. So in our studies, we've actually asked a range of different questions to better understand how asking for different ways of understanding the usefulness or the quality of our text changes um, what sort of descriptions will be preferred. So um, the last four are the most interesting ones, I think. So we have an imaginability question, which is sort of context independent almost, or the most that we could get to, which is just about how well can you imagine this image in your mind? Um, we ask relevance questions, which are getting at how well is the alt text actually connected to um, the context that the image is presented in. And ir irrelevance is an interesting counter side, which is, is there a lot of superfluous information that you didn't need to know about given the context? And then overall, it's just sort of the summary um, of those. And um, since we evaluated with sighted and blind and low vision participants, we could look at the correspondence between them according to these different measures. And we do find quite a reasonable correspondence, but these uh, actually come apart. For instance, when you ask for, for our study, blind and low vision participants really preferred long descriptions over shorter ones and sighted participants didn't have a preference at all. Like the that length difference didn't come out whatsoever. 
So um, what I'm meaning to say is basically we found that phrasings like how good is the description for overall non-visual accessibility if you actually motivate it, what accessibility means and why it's important, we see a strong correspondence between what our expert participants, which are the blind and low vision users, um, rate to be useful and what the sighted participants rate it to be useful. So that might be an, a helpful formulation that you could leverage. Um, it's important to present them in context and we do find that they are um, blind and low vision participants and sighted participants come apart um, because sighted participants are happy to forgive you if you write a description that doesn't seem to be related to the context. Like we had cases where blind and low vision participants said, this is worse than no description because they couldn't understand why this image appeared in this article for the uh, in the first place. Um, and the cited participants didn't show this sort of sensitivity. So what I'm trying to highlight with this is um, we shouldn't just assume that our cited editors or users or participants can always perfectly imitate what might be useful in practice for the specific blind and low vision community. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the cultural differences. There's a lot of work on you know, should you call it a wedding dress? Should you call it a costume? Should you call it, you know, um, all of these will are dependent on your cultural background and are very hard to capture. So I think it's still an open area of research and how we should best do this, but an awareness of what are the people who are currently judging this and does this reflect the population that needs to rely on those systems should be of utmost importance. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to take one more question. Actually, it's become a conversation on YouTube, but I think it's worth addressing and talking about in, in this context as well. And, and the original question has to do with essentially how is Wikimedia set up? Like, to what degree are captions and alt text image specific or context specific? So, like, where the image appears in the article versus general. Um, at least I don't want to put you on the spot for explaining all of the uh, intricacies, though, if you know all the intricacies of how the image or the alt text and captions are generated on Wikipedia, go for it. But I would, regardless, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on the importance of defining these once for an image versus um, defining them in very context specific ways. Yeah, um, I will not even attempt to answer this question on a Wikipedia specific way, because I know that there are people who know this better than I do. Um, but, uh, I want to highlight a few things here. One is, I do think that having a good description for an image, even if it's context independent, um, is better than no description at all for most situations, because usually the things that pictures are selected in a way, the images are selected in a way that the thing that's in the center and that's focused is the appropriate thing to describe for wherever the image is placed. Um, and so basically a context independent proxy is better than no idea of what the image is about at all in most Wikipedia contexts where images are specifically selected for a specific goal. However, I think we also need to be very careful in not making, making it seem like Wikipedia is more accessible and more perfectly accessible than it actually is. Um, so one thing that I've been noticing when working on the multilingual data is that it seems like, and I don't know this for certain, but especially with image galleries, um, in German Wikipedia, there are a ton of image galleries and there the rate of Im uh, all texts and captions are actually identical. And it looks like there's something going on that if an alt text isn't specified, then the captions is just infilled. Um, so there are definitely procedural questions that arise from this on whether this is good practice or not. And that might seem like, oh, all of these images have alt texts, but we don't know whether they are actually useful and good. So I think those are important considerations to keep in mind. And I'm very excited to hear that there are conversations about that. That's great. 
Thank you so much. I also I have so many more questions too about uh, thinking about the data set quality aspect of this and dealing with some of those complicated ways in which the alt text and captions are generated. But I'm going to keep myself quiet. I'm going to actually pass it now to Daniel so that we can get his presentation in and then we'll be able to return to questions at the end. Um, so at this point, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Elisa, for that presentation uh, on a very uh, important question. I think issues with image um, or descriptions were things I encountered as well uh, in, in this project, which I'm going to uh, talk about later. But thank you so much for um, that presentation. So hi, everyone. It's so nice to, to be here with you today. I want to thank everyone at uh, the Wikimedia Foundation for the opportunity to present uh, this work with you. Um, I would say that it, it certainly feels surreal to, to think about the, the first time uh, that I used the computer uh, after high school in, in Nigeria. And one of the first things I did was to go to Google and ask questions about some topics that I really liked. And of course, some of the, the, the top search results were from Wikipedia, right? So it's really interesting to now be talking about a project I did as an intern at Google uh, to people at Wikipedia. It makes me go back to some of those um, early experiences. So very excited to, uh, to be here. So I'll be uh, talking about a project I did as an intern at Google Research in uh, 2021. I did this work in collaboration with Peggy, uh, who was my host at the time, and, and then Daniel Krishna, who's on the call, and uh, Erfan Esad at Google Research. So this presentation will be in two parts. So first, I will do a quick overview of, of the system I built uh, during the internship and some of the findings from our evaluation of the system. And then I will talk about some of the challenges I faced in, in building this system and how recent progress in generative AI uh, since I built this system might help us rethink how to address uh, some of those uh, challenges. So user research uh, from industry and academia continues to show an increasing uh, preference from users uh, for content in new formats, uh, formats with shorter length and, and formats that appear in diverse platforms. So. Uh, new formats because they are engaging, uh, they increase uh, interactivity, uh, they perhaps in improve accessibility, whether visual, audio, language accessibility, and, and so on. Users also want uh, shorter length content for better or worse. Uh, perhaps we could blame that on uh, reducing attention spans, but people want content that's easy to consume, that's quick to understand, and uh, users also have time constraints. They don't want to spend so much time trying to understand uh, content. And then there's also the aspect of users wanting content integrated into existing experiences. So users that are getting uh, familiar with the story format, for example, might want content displayed in that format uh, for them. So drawing on, on these user needs, my goal for this research was to explore alternative experiences for structured content like Wikipedia articles, and then to design and implement a system that would automatically generate story formats from existing Wikipedia articles at scale. Uh, so the, so the, the goal here is to, is to consider how uh, one might at scale develop these sort of story formats for, for articles. And there's been, Prior works uh, in HCI that, that explored this idea of transforming content from one format to another to allow for interactive uh, navigation. So one example of such uh, projects is URL to video, uh, which allows you to convert a website to a pro promotional video. And then there are other ideas uh, in this area, such as how to cut audio visual slideshows which convert Wikipedia sections to slideshows and, and so on. And within Wikipedia, there are also ongoing efforts 
um, such as uh, yeah, I believe you know, Wiki Highlights, Wiki Stories, and found some uh, older websites uh, on Video Wiki. Uh, and to the right of this slide is a set of screenshots, uh, for example, page on, on Nelson Mandela uh, from Wiki Highlights. So as I said earlier, our, our goal is to convert Wikipedia articles to, to story format. And one might ask, you know, why, uh, why the story format as, as a choice here? So I think the, the features of web stories make it a great candidate uh, for this transformation, especially because it's convenient, it's mobile first, and it's built to optimize the viewing experience for users on a mobile format. It also has lots of accessibility benefits. Uh, it's lightweight, it has support for videos, images, you can embed audio as well, and it loads pretty, pretty fast. It's also easier to, to manipulate uh, compared to previous methods that attempt to convert Wikipedia to save videos, uh, for example. Uh, since these are HTML outputs, we can easily manipulate them. We can get also Wikipedia volunteers to, to do the same um, as well. Web stories are also open source. Uh, the, the specific product we use uh, for this research is hosted at amp.dev. Uh, the link is to the right. Uh, it's formerly called Accelerated Mobile Pages. And, and that's what we, we use as the output for uh, the generated stories. So the first question for us was if we wanted to convert articles to stories, what are some of the design constraints to consider? And so we looked at 50 manually created stories that are available online. So some of them you will find on app.dev, and some of them were new sites uh, and manually created uh, stories. And we we're looking out for features of these stories, such as how long were they, how did they present content, and how faithful were these uh, generated stories to the source article. So from these analysis of uh, 50, manually created articles, uh, we came up with these four design principles for, for our system. So these principles will guide you know, how many pages a web story can have, you know, how do we set up the flow of, of the pages, what, how do we think about formatting, you know, what are some of the user experience considerations in terms of the quality of the images, uh, the ability of the font size, you know, how many sentences that we have on the page. So those kind of open questions where uh, things we glean from these manually created uh, stories. So here is a high level system architecture diagram showing the Wikipedia pipeline process, uh, how we go from an input source article to um, a story output. I think I, I can probably come back to, to play this, uh, this very short video. Uh, but for the architecture, there are three key uh, components here. So the first component here, which is the article parser, and then uh, the second component here, the story planner, and then the final story creation. So I'll briefly discuss what happens at each uh, step of the pipeline here. So for the first step, the article parser, we take a Wikipedia article as input, and then we extract uh, relevant data from the Wikipedia page. So think of data like the page title, page description, and some of the section contents, uh, et cetera. And, and next, we retrieve images and image metadata related to the page. So I do this uh, using the Wikipedia image text uh, repository, uh, which uh, Krishna briefly hinted on. And this repository, uh, was chosen because it helps us get filtered images. So some pre-processing took place in, in the in the width data set that makes this much, much, much uh, suitable for a visual first display uh, like the, the story format. And then of course, we, we took other information like the source link, uh, section ID, the resolution, uh, image resolution uh, as well. The next step is where we plan the story. So we basically go over each section of the Wikipedia page, uh, of course, ignoring uh, the references, for example, but we go through each of the content sections, starting from the header, and perform an extractive uh, text summarization on, on each section. And we did this at the time, uh, in 2021, using uh, the Pegasus text summarization model, 
Uh, it was built on news articles and it performed best of course at the time. Uh, the field of NLP has probably evolved three generations <laughs> since then. Uh, but this model was uh, uh, used because we wanted to make the summarization extractive rather than abstracted. There were lots of issues with hallucinations and knowing that uh, Wikipedia articles tend to be content dense, we wanted to make sure that the summaries were faithful to, to the source article. And then next we created the main and section stories for, for the article. And the number of stories that you can create from uh, a given article would depend on the depth of the article. So for a very short Wikipedia article, you can have just one 10 page story. For a longer Wikipedia article, like the article for dog, uh, you can have several sub stories linking from uh, the, the main uh, sections. And for the story uh, creation components, we take the summarized sections and we match them to images uh, pulled from the, the WIC data set. And then we place these summary image pairs in templates. So as you can imagine, and not every section in Wikipedia has a corresponding image. Right? So there's a lot of image uh, repetition happening here, which I talk about later when we do the evaluation. Um, but but what we what we basically do is you you take a template, you take a summarized text, and you do an image selection process, looking at the list of images that we have. And then we created voiceovers for, for the text and image descriptions were available and generated the output HTML for, for each Wikipedia page. And I'm happy to, to answer more questions uh, around that if, if anyone has them at, at the end of the presentation. So I've described this uh, three-stage process of parsing the article, planning the story and creating the story. And the next step uh, is evaluating uh, the stories that were uh, generated. So we mass generated 500 web articles and inspected them. Uh, for the purpose of our inspection, we uh, focus on article categories for animal, architecture, city, and plant. And this was chosen because one of the assumption uh, with this first version of Wikid's story um, is that we assume that you have more than one images, uh, more than one image in in on the page, and that's not often the case for most of the other uh, types of Wikipedia categories. So we 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 pick these because they will give us um, more variety in in the output, and then we also tested this with fourteen users uh, who were uh, mostly young. Uh, mobile users uh, who are Wikipedia savvy and familiar with the story format. And our goal was to have them use the outputs from Wikipedia story and uh, get a sense of the, the, their feedback on, on the user um, experience. Some key findings from our evaluation of the end-to-end -end system uh, is that first we find that thanks to the developed design heuristics, we were able to create web stories that were comparable to those um, manually created. And we also found that the pipeline was relatively easy to, uh, to replicate at scale. So even without optimization, each page took about three minutes uh, to generate uh, the, the stories for, for an entire page. And this is also mostly due to the fact that depending on the, the size of the page, you have to do end summarizations uh, for, for each of the, the sections. I've mentioned that this system was implemented in, in C++, uh, if, if that helps. Um, yeah, and then our user testing also showed that the users had very positive reviews um, of, the, of the story experience. So when we compared with a baseline of the actual uh, Wikipedia article, uh, users found that Wikipedia story outputs were easier to engage with, they were better for understanding content, and they were certainly much more uh, pleasing to, to read. However, uh, users did not you know, think that the, the Wikipedia story outputs were great for locating information because on the actual Wikipedia page, you can simply do a control S and we didn't have a, um, a search feature for Wikipedia story, and that you know 
reflected in the user rating of how easy it was to locate information. One other key finding from the user study is how the story format spotlights the image content gap for many pages on Wikipedia. So when you have a Wikipedia article with a diversity of images, users tend to enjoy the experience because the images are now right in their faces and you know they appreciate the images more. In a page where there are you know fewer images, you know, users tend to mention that, you know, I wish there were more images. This would have improved my experience and how much I enjoy uh, reading about these articles. So that certainly um, shows itself in inspecting the 500 pages we generated that a lot of the images did not, um, did not have, uh, a lot of the pages did not have sufficient images to create an interesting uh, story. So in this, uh, second half of, of the talk, I will discuss some uh, challenges I, I faced during this and some of the opportunities that I you know, was thinking about just uh, preparing for, uh, for this talk. So the first challenge that comes to mind is you know, going through the process of parsing an article and summarizing the article that takes the bulk of the of the runtime, right? So it's it's pretty straightforward to you know think of how we can take the generated output from the second stage of the pipeline and create the story, but most of the work goes to you know trying to summarize uh, the article. And so one of the uh, the ways to think about this is considering recent growth in in the capabilities of language models. What opportunities do we have to improve both the, the quality and the efficiency of the parsing and summarization. So in, think about instead of doing, you know, some for loop over N sections, can we simply prompt a model and say, summarize this Wikipedia article uh, and do this section by, by section? I added an example to this slide, but this, I call it an easy prompting because I didn't think too hard at all. Like no prompt engineering went into this. This is the first thing that came to my mind. And it, it tries to do a good job. Like this looks exactly like what I was doing three years ago behind the scenes, trying to do for loop and you know, make calls to a Pegasus model. Uh, so we see that you know, perhaps LLMs could do a better job in sort of reducing the time it takes to parse these models and, and uh, summarize by, by sections. The other thing for sure that I was uh, thinking about uh, while working on this project is how we could expand uh, systems like Wikipedia Story to more languages and, and context. And we see again, this connection to uh, LLM systems that are able to sufficiently process data structures and, and do language translation. Uh, that just asking uh, the Google uh, the Google Gemini LLM to take the previous results, which was the summarization of section by section, and convert it to say Swahili or Nigerian Pidgin, it, it does a pretty decent job. Again, I'm not doing any prompt engineering. I'm literally just typing the first thing that comes to mind. So if it's if it's this promising, then there's certainly, uh, I think, an opportunity to explore how uh, these models might might support this this aspect of the work. One of the limitation of uh, prior text summarization models was, in my experience, the inability to handle complex data structures. So on Wikipedia, you will find lots of tables, you would find lots of uh, multi-level lists, you find cladrograms, you find different types of structures outside simple text. The current system ignores those because Pegasus wasn't designed to think through these types of data structure. Again, a weak uh, prompting. In fact, interestingly, in this case, I'm asking Gemini AI to summarize a table in the Wikipedia page for elephant in a series of sentences. I didn't pass in the table. I was trying to see you know, if uh, Gemini AI would be able to figure out what table I was talking about. And it does, again, a pretty good job of identifying the living species table in the elephant Wikipedia page. 
uh, summarizing those um, for me. So that that certainly gives me um, an intuition that perhaps some of the data structures that text summarization models struggle with, uh, maybe today's LLMs can help us um, summarize them and present them in a fun way to, uh, to use it. There's certainly uh, the, the question of image sourcing and, and matching. Uh, when you're working on a, a project that tries to present a visual first representation of Wikipedia articles, one of the first things that, that you encounter is that many pages do not have sufficient images to, to make it fun. And one opportunity that is presented here is how we can explore multimodal systems that can search the web as agents and retrieve images that might be useful for uh, corresponding sections. Of course, it begs, it begs the question uh, how that might fit into Wikipedia's current workflow. Uh, so maybe um, a human in the loop system might, might be a way to, to think about this, but kind of the, the thinking that comes here is can we explore uh, using LLMs as agents for doing this sort of image sourcing and image mapping and, and, and what that would look like. And I'm happy to, to talk more about my, my thinking if anyone has a, a question. And the final thing here is from our user studies, one of the questions that come to the minds of users is, you know, I don't want to read the whole article. Can you generate these interesting stories based on things that I really care about? So. Think of perhaps users passing, you know, search queries or you know, whatever uh, user-provided data that we can use to guide uh, the story generation. So here I attempt to um, ask a model to query the article for Nelson Mandela and to focus only on specific sections. So we see that this sort of um, user-guided or keyword-guided generation is also possible. These sections do not the sections and the results here do not exist, exist in the actual article, but the language model is able to, to generate a reasonable JSON format uh, that's tied to, um, to the user question. So there, there are three points that I, that I hope uh, you take uh, from this talk. And the first is that new interactive formats, uh, such as stories can improve experiences and reach new uh, and existing uh, Wikipedia communities. Um, I believe uh, these formats uh, have the potential to, to make Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia even more fun. I, I also, I think secondly, the, the story format places the spotlight on the quality and quantity of images like, like I've discussed in Wikipedia articles. And even users that would typically go to Wikipedia for uh, content specifically we're interested in commenting on the images. And thirdly, I believe uh, in the past three years since I worked on, on this project that there are new opportunities for um, generative ML to support some of the some of the tasks that we were trying to do heuristically um, in the past. Uh, you can find the, the full paper on archive uh, at the back of the, uh, on this slide. And I'm happy to to take any questions uh, on this if you if you have them. But if you want to ask them uh, later, you can, you can send me an email to to the address uh, in the paper. And I want to thank you again for the opportunity and and for your time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Daniel. This is a really wonderful presentation, and I can say, at least for my own thinking, I work a lot with like assessing article quality, and that's one of the domains I've been doing some modeling work. And already, this is helping me to. In that domain, we have to think like, does this article have an image, right? And so, what you're, I think, it was the second takeaway about the important. Like, I'm already like, oh, actually, there's this next level up of like, does it have enough images where, you know, this sort of format where you can imagine this much more rich interaction with the article. So it's already helping me uh, think through and uh, update some of my thinking around that. So I, I very much appreciate that. Um, at this point, I'm going to open up uh, questions to the room. If there's anyone in the room who has questions for Daniel, um, the floor is yours.
go for it, Alisa. I knew that I could I could hold out long enough. Somebody would have a question. <laughs> Um, I'm just, this is a low level question, but I'm interested in how you're imagining this integration in Wikipedia. Is it like I go on the Wikipedia page and then there's this story popping up and I can then choose a format or is it about, you know, transitioning the Wikipedia content in like social media domains and for that it would be a useful tool. Can you say something about that? Yes, I think it's, it's a combination of both. So I, I do not envision this as for sure a replacement of Wikipedia in any way. I think the, the, the first thing is knowing that Wikipedia tends to be dense with information. So even by summarizing, you're losing out on some other information uh, by doing that. And so the goal is to complement Wikipedia by offering this alternative way of enjoying and consuming uh, the content. And whether that happens on social media, which I think will be interesting as some interactive video format, or whether that happens as an alternative feature on the Wikipedia website. I think both of those uh, would, of course, I think social media would help us reach people who would typically not want to um, go directly to the Wikipedia article. I think that's that's been shown that people would rather learn content from social media than go to the original uh, website. But I think both both would work, whether having these sort of format on social media or having it as an option on uh, Wikipedia. Right now, the way it's designed is every page on the story links back to the corresponding section on the Wikipedia page. So I feel like, oh, nice summary. I'd like to know more. Then that takes you back to read the whole thing. Thank you for the question. Go for it, Layla. Um, I just wanted to uh, chime in here on uh, this topic on Elisa's uh, question, just follow up to share some internal perspectives uh, from the foundation that can be helpful for our thinking and also for other people who are listening in, either now or in the future. So within Wikimedia Foundation, we are kind of grappling with the question of like on-platform versus off-platform as well. Uh, so this is something that this line of research is generally very interesting for us because we don't know what our, um, the on-platform versus on-platform distribution of users going to be um, in the future years, um, especially with the rise of AI-based tools and their availability for content creation and how people are consuming knowledge. There are just a lot of open questions, right? So. Um, generally, it is like I would like to encourage this line of research of carefully thinking about ways um, that we experiment with and we learn both on platform and off platform because um, we need to continue to learn in, in this space. Um, and again, like uh, both of the research topics uh, that you know we're covering, and the people who are involved are um, you know extremely careful in the ways of you know designing these experiments and thinking about how to do this respectfully with regards to the ethics of the projects and respecting Wikipedia. So um, very much happy to see um, both of the lines of work that are happening. And again, like I just wanna encourage both like on platform and off platform thinking. Um, to, on the topic of on platform, there's a lot of like design choices that need to be made for something like this, of course, to eventually end on Wikipedia beyond like community considerations and other aspects of it. Um, uh, and I hope that those don't limit you know, research and experimentation at this point, which is something that we, we really need to do on top of everything else that needs to be done. And I think, Lola, too, if I can build on that one, one thing I was thinking about, and Daniel, you brought this up, the kind of human in the loop type approach. And I was thinking about the different spaces in which people can kind of uh, work with the tool um, like like what you all were prototyping. And I can imagine, you know, there's obviously image selection, there's like the text kind of, you know, intervening in the types of text, there's ordering choices. And I was wondering, and maybe there's more that aren't coming to mind. And I was curious to hear your thoughts about like where in this process do you find it's maybe most useful to have people kind of guiding the choices? Um, yeah, just your thoughts in, in that space. You know, that's a good question. I think what at least implementing this project, what comes to mind the most is in the image selection and matching uh, phase because of all of the thinking that has to go into, you know, how do we, first, how do we 
generate the, the images or at least get the images rather by story formats incentivizing people to contribute more uh, on Wikipedia. Because, oh, I would like my stories to look good, so I have to go to Wikipedia and, and contribute. Maybe that can happen. We don't we don't know, like just like Leila said. Um, the other question is, you know, can we synthetically generate these images and then have people human in the loop say good image or bad image? We could argue that that's still volunteers deciding what goes on the platform, even if they're not necessarily generating or, you know, getting these images um, themselves. So I think the, the image selection is one place I see uh, human in the loop systems uh, working effectively. I think in terms of the the actual content or what subset of a page should be presented, I'm tilting more towards the user guiding that, right? Because it's it's hard for us to find a combination of summaries that would address every user's you know concern for a given article. So if we can um, think of ways to summarize based on maybe user search queries or whatever personal information or data that the user has willingly uh, provided. Um, I think that's the human in the loop that's not, it's it coming from, you know, learning from these sort of search queries and, and personalization, uh, which, which I talked about um, earlier. Go for it, Miriam. Yeah, I think I have a question for maybe both of you and maybe others in the call who I know worked on this aspect. So you both touched briefly on the multilingual aspect of the work, but most of your work is at, at the moment in, in English. And uh, Daniel, you, you showed something in Nigeria, Pidgin, which is interesting because it's one of the least represented languages on Wikipedia, despite the huge number of speakers, right? Um, so I uh, know 100% how already like putting this work together uh, going, you know, multiple modalities is, is difficult. So um, th this, I, I really, it's, it's really wonderful work. But when we want to go on top of multimodal, also multilingual, what are the challenges that you envision and that we should think about? Lisa, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, so I'm really interested in the multilingual space. And I mean, the the one graph I showed from the multilingual analysis is one of many I have and have not shared before. So I, I should really put something together and share that more with the Wikimedia community. Um, but so um, in the multilingual space, especially, I think there are a lot of low hanging fruits is I think the positive way of framing this, where a lot of alt text is actually still in other languages than the rest of the text or the caption. So I think the alt text quality control is just really low, which you can see like in file names being there and so on. But especially when you go in the multilingual space, a lot of the texts, like the alt text, are actually not in the appropriate language. Like this is the first thing. Um, and then Obviously, there are, I think, opportunities in if there's correspondence between articles. Like, um, I've looked a lot into the Wikipedia article of bananas and as a like, great case study. And for instance, if you look into the, uh, into the translations into many languages, a lot of the images are actually the same. Um, and they appear still in the same context. So there might be an opportunity for using translational tools um, to scale from English, which might have a lot of editors or German, which might have a lot of editors to other languages who have less editors and get like an approxy, uh, an appropriate proxy. This is still giving the caveat of there are cultural differences that also come with different languages and backgrounds that, that, that go with it. But I would say these are interesting avenues one might be able to go further into. But I think for all text coverage, we st we still need to work at the basics of just making sure that it's even the right language and making that more visible would be great. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I think that's also um, related to 
how I think about it for um, creating other modalities such as stories, for example. And I do think though that given how it's currently, or the system is currently structured right now, that having better text translation systems can push us closer. So it's, I, I can't say whether that would work for images as well, because like Elisa mentioned, some of the, the images themselves might be context specific in a way that we may not easily transfer them across context. But I think for the text, with progress in translation systems, it may not be too challenging to um, to convert a system that works in English uh, to to do the translation in in a new language. Again, uh, the hope is that volunteers in any specific language is able to validate these translations and and the output before it, it goes public. But I think there's certainly potential for translation systems to to help with this. Thank you both. I think that's a really excellent question to, to bring this showcase to a close on. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Kinaret to close us out. Thanks, Isaac. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's showcase and the discussion. I especially want to thank our speakers, Elisa and Daniel, for their contributions. I'd like to thank the showcase uh, coordination team, Isaac and Eli, for helping and setting this up. Uh, our next showcase will be on Wednesday, May 15th, and we'll focus on the journey from becoming a reader to an editor. So join us then. That's it for now. Thank you.